Hello and welcome to my 15th interview in Collaborate Zero, Mark Jankovic from Delphus Eco. This interview concludes the contributions for the book series that we're putting together, which we will be handing out at COP in a few weeks time. So very excited to be talking to Dr. Mark Spaulding, who is a, an absolute legend in conservation and marine science. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. Thank you so much for, for making the time. I know you're a, you're, you're a busy man. And there's lots going on. But um, in, 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 the, in the last of this set of, of interviews, which, which um, we're, we're rapidly trying to, to get put together and put to bed by Friday to get printed, to go to COP. I think it's super interesting that we talk to somebody who's been in the science field for the last 30 years trying to do, try, trying to do all of this. And I think no, nowhere is the coastal areas, uh, the coral reefs more obvious that the world is so totally connected. Um, and what happens in a foreign country Hap, you know, the impact is on, on a coral reef miles and miles away. And I think the one of the things to think about or discuss is the them and us piece. But before we get to them and us, a um, bit, about, bit about you. 30 years ago, what, what was the spark to become a, a marine scientist? Actually, I think it was more than 30 years ago because I, I think it was, it, it was, it was childhood. Uh, I always loved nature, but... Um, I, I, I suppose I had the good fortune. My father worked abroad, and I, I first saw my first coral reef, aged uh, eleven, okay. and probably never looked back. Uh, I was completely entranced and enthralled that you could open your eyes underwater and be in something that was more exciting than than the most packed aquarium you could ever visit. And uh, so it, I was sort of immediately dragged that way with my interest in nature towards the underwater world, and and, and really carried on that route, learned to dive. Uh, worked on the Barrier Reef and so on. So it was, it was um, I don't know if it was <laughs> destiny or what, but it, it was from a very early age. And, and it, I think it's impossible to to uh, work in, in the world of nature and not be deeply concerned about the state of nature. And um, so obviously conservation quickly dragged me uh, in that direction. Um, and you know, if we, you mentioned coral reefs, so we, I suppose the, the climate change angle on this for me hit me really hard uh, in 1998. Uh, I'd already been doing some pretty exciting field research um, around the world and I decided I'd lead my own expedition to explore the coral reefs of the Seychelles. And, uh, the, the Seychelles, if you've been at all, you'll, most people go to the, the, the granitic islands up at the, the northern edge of this huge marine country. Uh, but we took a boat and we sailed essentially sort of transect, if you like, for a thousand, over a thousand kilometers to some of the most remote coral reefs on the planet. The, the aim was to count fish and with other people to look at the corals and so on. Um, but we hit that during this extraordinarily warm year in 1998. There was El Nino. Um, and when we arrived, uh, the corals were bleached. It's a stress response to the water being a bit too warm. Um, and what had intended to be this sort of wonderful adventure turned into this documentation of decline. And that over the 10 weeks or so that we were there, we watched, essentially we watched all the coral die on all of the Seychelles coral reefs for a thousand kilometers. Um, and it was remarkably depressing. And as we, when we came back, we learned that, of course, this wasn't just in the Seychelles. It was a planetary impact for the first time. People had seen this effect before locally, different places, individual species. But this happened in every coral reef region on the planet simultaneously, pretty much. And we saw a global drop in the, num in the amount of coral. Now, recovery followed from that. So it wasn't the end of coral reefs, but it was... Uh, uh, they were the canaries in the coal mine, if you like. It was a pointer to what can happen as temperatures warm up. And I, it was a real shock. Even the scientists weren't prepared to see that. So that, for me, was a huge eye-opener um, to, the, to the risk we're all under, really, from climate change. I mean, that's one of the, the big challenges of being a, being a scientist. It's, it's, it's converting incredible academic work into policy. And that's mm -hmm. you know, one of the 
one of the questions is in your journey you must have had blockers in kind of getting people to see and feel and and change have you what's what's worked what, what do you think is is the, the key to get policy get people to to realize that we all have an impact yeah, I think the, the hard thing for scientists is that, you know, I think a lot of scientists feel like they're shouting to the blue in the face. You know, we've, we've been talking about this issue for decades. Uh, and if you look back at the early models, they were spot on. It really, I mean, you know, nothing, the, the average is still pretty close to what they thought 30 years ago. So climate change isn't a surprise in that sense. We've known what was happening, but we haven't been able to get people to listen. I think... Um, Strangely, it was the same year, in 1998, uh, we, I collaborated with some others to produce um, a report called Reefs at Risk with the World Resources Institute and others, trying to get the message out, because that's the big challenge, I think, for many scientists. So we wrote this report, and we, we somehow must have pushed the right buttons. It just got the right traction. Uh, we sent it broadly. It was not aimed at scientists. It was aimed at a broad policy public audience. Um, and it got huge coverage in all the major newspapers, I got a phone call from Tandy L, who was then the, the, the father of the House of Commons, as it were, and he rang me up saying, I've got a debate in the parliament. I want you to give me some questions for the prime minister. And, and suddenly I just thought, wow, <laughs> this is what we need because we've got to get people to listen. And that challenge of getting people to listen is huge. Um, the other side of it is sometimes I possibly we create our, our own blockers, if you like, our own obstacles. And they... Another story perhaps was going more recently to the Economist Ocean Summit uh, to talk about the value of nature. And I was in an audience that I'm not particularly comfortable with, sort of the, the, the banking world and the financing world and so on. And, and I, I had always it's been almost seen almost as the enemy, <laughs> the cause of the problem. And there I was suddenly sharing, sharing the floor, sharing uh, coffees and so on with people who were desperately keen to help. You know, they would say, how can we invest our money in a way that is going to change the planet? And I suddenly, my eyes, the scales fell off and I suddenly realized, okay, no, we're, we're in this together and there's actually a lot of people who can help. And, you know, perhaps I was prior to that creating my own uh, blockers and thinking that, you know, this is all about you know, sort of people like me trying to save the planet. And of course it isn't. So uh, I'm not so sure, Mark. I think, I, I, I think you were slightly out there in that the banking and finance world is playing catch up. I had these arguments with them a long time ago when I was in banking and they weren't listening then. So, so I think absolutely there's a realization that we need to deploy real private capital to try and live in a better world. Uh, and mm. how do we do that? Um, I suppose one of the questions was that deployment of capital are you seeing it being deployed properly? Are you seeing, we, we get phone calls every day saying offset your carbon and, and uh, help plant some, some seagrass. I, I'm not convinced that any of these programs are that well thought through. So do you see any, any um, carbon offsetting projects that you think we should give a shout out to and or what capital is being deployed that other bankers can have confidence to try and go after. Yeah, um, so offsetting in particular is a is a is a thorny issue. Um, there's a huge risk, I think, with with offsetting that that um, people are going to uh, think of it as a magic wand. Polluters are going to think, okay, we can carry on polluting. Uh, we can just sort of salve our conscience and and put money aside, and, and that that's clearly not going to work. We, 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 we've got to stop burning fossil fuels. We, it's just got to stop. Um, on the other hand, if, if we, th we, you know, the, the, the world is facing a pretty urgent crisis at this point, um, and any solution to climate change is going to be massively multifaceted. So we have to think of everything. And I think it can be a Band-Aid, part of the package, um, as long as it's additional and not an excuse. So if you can think of it like that, first of all, any individual company or whatever needs to carbon neutralize themselves. Yeah. Then over and above, you can start to think about uh, whether you might start investing elsewhere to, to, to help offset the problem, not your particular part of the problem. And I think, then I think there is a space for that. And, and you know, the offsetting might be 
might be through natural climate solutions, the, 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 in other words, the, the, the protection or the, or the planting of forests or restoration of marshes and seagrasses and so on. Those things certainly suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and hold it there, and that's a good thing. Um, but we, 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 we can't use it as an, as an excuse. I think that's my, my big concern there. So, so all companies should invest internally to get to net zero first and then think about offsetting where they can. Yeah. And then, you know, there are probably cases and places where it's actually in the short term impossible to, to carbon neutralize certain aspects of the business or, or your own lifestyle. And at that point, too, you can you can still, I think, legitimately say, well, OK, I can't do this just yet for whatever logistical reason, but, but I will I will invest elsewhere as well. It's not not completely one or the other but it can't be that it can't be an excuse i think that's my concern i, I saw on monday that nasa sent up the old landsat 9 the latest satellite which as they, I mean, they said it's, it, it maps the world every three days every square inch of the world gets mapped every three days I and mean, that must be hugely beneficial for the work that you're doing but also for the you know, the, the classic offsetting projects of buy a tree in Madagascar when you have no idea if the tree actually is in Madagascar. Um, like, do, you, do you see, are you guys collaborating with that kind of data input to, to help map the world and, and monitor what's going on? Very much so. I think, um, so I, I, obviously as a, as a sort of coastal marine scientist, my focus is in that area um, and we've been, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wonderful collaboration called um, the Global Mangrove Alliance. We're working with mangrove forests um, and we've set up a, a, a platform called Global Mangrove Watch, uh, which is we're getting towards real time monitoring of the extent of mangroves. Uh, and it parallels something called Global Forest Watch, um, which has been been around for some time now, which is really enabling this real time monitoring of forests um, to the extent for example that uh, we can we can spot uh, challenges we can spot threats we can also monitor recovery and change uh, a nice story was when a uh, nice story sad story in Brazil you probably remember a couple of years ago when these terrible fires were, were spreading through the Amazon and we had uh, Bolsonaro saying no there's no fires that actually you could you could click on global uh, forest watch and see the fires in real time and you know the the, the lie of that president was immediately uh, and comprehensively exposed so we're, we're at that point where we can start to do that it's still challenging but but uh, it's going to be important as, as you probably know lots of countries are making these these uh, commitments and nationally determined contributions these commitments of what they will do to get us to net zero. Um, and a lot of those commitments are around um, natural habitats and either preventing further loss or actually restoring these habitats. And, and uh, we need to have independent monitoring of those to prevent countries cheating or companies, I suppose, cheating, uh, your offset companies cheating or whoever it is. And so we, we, we need these, but uh, the, the work is moving pretty fast. As you said, there's, there's improved satellite imagery all the time, which is helping a lot. Yeah, the, the, one of the things that I, I, um, I find very difficult is the, the notion of them and us. And one of the, the, the people I, uh, on this series I was very lucky to interview um, is trying to push a, a new way of education. And, and my question was, we need, we need school, we need classrooms to be sharing classrooms all over the world. We've got the technology to do it. There's nothing stopping a, uh, an individual in, in Kent linking with a, an, an individual in, in Nairobi or Mombasa and going, look what we're seeing today. Um, and I think it, it, that modern technology will make it incredibly real. And then it, it, it brings it into your own home. Um, so so I, th I think technology is going to play, a, uh, well, I'd like to hope that technology will play a, a really binary role. Um, so independent monitoring, so that's really important. So, I mean, one of my questions is, what levers do we need to, to scale change, to change this thing dramatically? And, and you know, around levers, that's around government, NGOs, business. What, what are your thoughts there? 
Uh, you, you, um, it's interesting. Um, I think we've, I've already said, you know, scientists have been, in a sense, crying out <laughs> their message for a long time. Uh, and it, it, it has taken a very long time to get through. Um, I think one of the challenges science has had has been that it's, it's often been countered by vested, vested interests, powerful industry, or, or actually even just political elements who don't want to hear the science. Um, and uh, in the confrontation of, of truth to power, power has won, I think, kind of too often. Um, and, and, and yet, and I think you've pointed this in some of your other interviews, we, we are now starting to see some real hopeful flashes of hope, if you like, that are coming from multiple sectors, from, from obviously the science is still telling the story, but we're starting to see elements in industry, elements in, in uh, the finance sector, and huge amounts from community, civil society, who are just reaching this boiling point, really, of, 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 of getting it out there. Um, and I think it's, it really is just that collaboration, that sharing that like you just mentioned, this, this global connectivity, which is enabling us at last to get a sort of momentum that's big enough, uh, that's actually possibly going to start wrong footing the politicians and the people uh, and, and leadership. I, you know, in a sense, I, my, my kids were all, were all on strike last Friday on the climate strike here. And they've, I think that move has, has really been very powerful. That movement has been very powerful because it's been easier for, you know, a cynical politician or a, or a sort of industrial dinosaur, if you like, to sort of tell a lie, a bold lie, uh, in pushing back against people who are talking the science. But, but it's harder, I think, for them to lie to a child, to, to lie to this new movement that's coming up from the bottom. And, um, and, and I think it's really helped a lot. So coming from multiple fronts, getting this, this momentum and just keeping this connectivity has been, is critically important, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly feels like everybody's galvanizing behind a symbol, a, a, a single approach. And I think one of the, in my previous life, I, I ran a, the charity and philanthropy department. And what always frustrates me was that you'd have loads of charities doing very similar things. And from a, you know, from an ocean cleanup plastic perspective, there are loads of charities that do that. It's how do we galvanize all of that intelligence, that goodwill, that behavior into a single place where it's just, instead of it being repeated thousands of times, that always has always challenged me. Are you seeing with all the work that you're doing on the ground, more and more people are starting to work together and pull in the same direction? Yes and no. I think, I, I mean, I, I already mentioned but this, this uh, global mangrove alliance and uh, is, 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 I mean, for me, it's quite a model because the NGO world is like that too. You know, the NGOs are all sort of vying for funding and want the, want the spotlight for, on their work. But actually under this particular alliance, we've got all many of the biggest NGOs, each of whom have partners on the ground. Um, <clears throat> and in the world of mangrove forests, they're doing tremendous advances in protection and restoration, creating alternative livelihoods for people who are perhaps destroying the mangrove forests, giving a voice to villages, and communities to protect their own mangroves against uh, other vested interests. Um, and, you know, someone who's doing a restoration project in Thailand can learn from someone doing a similar restoration project in uh, Puerto Rico or in, or in Panama. And, and so there's creating this connectivity. So it's there, that's a nice model. And uh, I, I'm not directly involved in the, in the big international policy agendas like uh, forthcoming Cop in Glasgow, but I'm, I'm increasingly feeling that there is this collaboration there too, that the, you know, the NGOs are talking to each other and, and like-minded governments are starting to build these collaborations in, in quite a powerful way. So fingers crossed, I hope, <laughs> we're doing some of the right things. Uh, actually, yeah, that is, one of my questions is the magic wand question. So if you had a magic wand, what, what would you do? I don't want to say that would be it, but what would you, what would you do? Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, the, the, the problem, well, the solutions to climate, to, to this challenge are going to be so multifaceted, I can't really point at one. I think 
if I'm really indulging myself in a flight of fantasy, I'd say that we've reached now just the level of sort of public awareness that we should have had 20 years ago. So I'd like to keep that public awareness and just turn the clocks back 20 years. That would be, <laughs> be my magic wand. Um, because I think you know, had we been where we are 20 years ago, the, the threat of climate change would have been far more quickly sorted out. I think if I, maybe one thing that I, no, it's just come to mind, but <laughs> there's, a, there's still an incredibly powerful lobbying force which is slowing things down. Uh, and if we could do something to hold the lobbying which is going on, which is sometimes industry lobbying, sometimes just political lobbying. But if we could stop the voices that are somehow pushing out um, lies, basically around the, around the threat and around what, what's causing it, would that would be tremendously helpful. Because I get the feeling now politicians are almost falling behind, quite far behind public opinion. The public's ready for this, but they're being held back because they're being pushed by some of the big industrial. Um, forces, I suppose. What did a hundred a hundred companies responsible for seventy one percent of all greenhouse gas emissions or the fossil fuels that drive that? I mean, you know, it's not that many people uh, with a very very powerful voice. Yeah, and, and politicians are by definition slow moving, so um, it, it's a. Yeah, I think keep building public awareness. Yeah, try and stop lobbying and get politicians to speed up. Not, yeah, not, yeah. A, 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 a decent wish list for the for the magic 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 one question. Um, so you said you're not going to COP, but with COP, what do you what, what hopes do you think will come out of COP, or what what would be a, a, a result if there is a any, any possible result of a COP? I mean, we're still at that wrangling stage and it's always last minute. I, and I'm not close close to the, uh, the, the front line or of that, but it's obviously getting commitments that are going to come into effect. And I think it's come into effect quickly is the critical thing here. Promises from China to do something by 2050, a, a, a whitewash, a greenwash perhaps. They're, they're, not, they're not what we want. I mean, we need people to be making commitments about what they're going to do next week. I mean, it's reached that level of sort of urgency that, you know, pushing off and saying, well, we'll do something by 20, 2040 isn't, isn't enough um, anymore. So it's, I hope we're going to start getting commitments to divide. I guess from my perspective as a, as a conservation, conservationist, um, there will be lots of talk about how we can use nature as part of this package of solutions. And we're going to be pushing hard particularly around what we call blue carbon, mangroves, um, tidal marsh, salt marshes, and, and um, seagrasses. They're in fact some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet, I mean, sort of uh, working alongside tropical rainforests for their power to pack carbon. And, and more than that, they're carbon sequesterers. They're the only effective carbon scrubbers we have, we know of, that function now, because unlike other forests, they continue to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Even a mature forest, they pack it into the soil underneath where it stays for millennia. Uh, now, most forests that the soil carbon reaches a sort of plateau and then starts to gas off, if you like, as it, as it decomposes. They don't decompose in the soils of these, wet, of these salty wetlands, so they stay there forever. So you, you're carrying on doing it. They're not, they're not the magic wand because they're not extensive. They're not going to make a huge difference. But if I had you know, a, a chunk of money to spend, I would look very closely at the idea of investing in, in some mangrove restoration as, a, as one of the uh, opportunities, perhaps, uh, to, to, to turn things around in a small way. And, and uh, I mean, on that question, are there projects that, that people can confidently you know, commit money to? There are, and there's, there's growing efforts, and I'm, I can't sort of name them because I, I don't, I'm not that close to it, but there are some quite good efforts now to ensure that, the, the, that when people are investing in some of these natural climate solutions, we call them, uh, that there's, there's some independent verification and standards for those. So um, I could look those up and try and send some to you, but they're, they're, I think it's very important that we've got this independent certification going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So don't take, their, don't take their word for it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, and I, I had a, I had an idea where I mean, in my where I grew up, there are a number of farmers who have farmland that go down to the sea, and I kind of took talked to them and said, "Why don't we take at least two hundred, three hundred meters of this farm land and give it back to nature, and then convert it into a conservancy, becomes a nature reserve, forever cannot be touched as a farm again." I spoke to the local authorities about it, and they, it wasn't, it isn't legally possible yet. So we probably, it sounds like we need, certainly in that country, we need laws to catch up where people want to do this. Whereas at the moment, it's just beyond their legal ability. Sure. Uh, <laughs> the, the legal framing is pretty important, and uh, yeah, that varies country to country, but enabling these good actions is critical. Yeah. yeah it's, it's interesting how, the, yes, there's, there's Western money or you know, sort of Northern money. But when you meet farmers in South Africa, they, they're living the fact that there are no bees. Uh, and they need to now asking themselves, how do we rehabilitate, rehabit bees on farms? Um, which is, a, which is a, a, re a reality. Books, podcasts, readings, scientists reports that you think people should gen up on other than obviously the books that you've written which are are incredible and the the world authority on reefs and mangroves are a must read for everybody um well they're quite technical although the latest state of the world mangrove report is, is intended to kind of tell the quick story of mangroves for anyone who wants it so feel free to look that up you know, I think I, there was a, I don't, the late David Mackay, who was at Cambridge, uh, wrote a fantastic book called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. It's an e-book uh, and a hard copy, and you can get it free online. But he did a fantastic job of, of bringing this, uh, the complexity of all this and the solutions, what we can and what we can't expect out of the solutions. It kind of demythologizes a lot of the issues. And it's a sort of, it's a very richly logical progression of, of, um, of what we can do and, and showing us how we, we will we'll get there only by multiple different efforts around sustainable energy, around preventing further deforestation, around changing action uh, and so on. And I think it's a very powerful, uh, still, although it's five years old now, um, sort of explanation of how we have to think in, from a scientific perspective. You know, another one, I, two other thoughts though, very quick. One was, um, because the, the science, as I've said, the science is strong, it always has been. There was a, a letter at the start of this month by the Pope, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and I think the Patriarch of the Orthodox Churches, uh, which you could read, but I, I think the message is that from their perspective, this is a deeply moral issue. And I think that's nice that you've got the science argument and you've got the, if you like, the moral argument. And then last off, maybe it's nothing to read, but maybe you should uh, start, we should all start looking at uh, what Greta and her friends are saying on Instagram. Uh, in a sense, to give those three sort of facets of, of why this is urgent and what we should be doing and to give us that drive because Yes, we can keep reading, but actually, I think it's time for action. Uh, in fact, it will, it'll never be too late because we can always you know, make things better than, than they will be otherwise. But uh, it, it really is the time for action now. And so, yes, read, but don't get bogged down in reading. Uh, let's do stuff. <laughs> That's brilliant. That is absolutely fantastic. I mean, what a fascinating conversation Mark thank you so much there's, there's so much in there I mean that main 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 driver is we've just got to keep the pressure on the topic and the message going and make sure that it's in everybody's conscience and I think that answers my my them and us question which is how do we how do we get everybody on the same page and that's it it's just keep telling the story and keep getting it out there and, and if we can, we can we can add some confidence around the, the data um, it's time for action and, and, I, and I love 
we need commitments next week, not in 2014. Yeah. So, that is superb. Mark, thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, apologies for the breakdown in the middle. That, that's Instagram for you. It's never, <laughs> it's never perfect. Um, no, it's uh, okay. I'll, I'll send you a version. Uh, and um, and I'm not sure, when, you're not going to cop. Will you be a cop? No? I won't be a cop. No, I'll be thinking of, I think, thinking of you all there. Well, well, I, 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 haven't got, I haven't got a ticket. I'll be standing outside kind of you know, waving at people. Um, right. So, so no, I, I'll, I'll be there for two weeks, but um, no formal invitation. But I imagine but, there'll be lots of it will be available virtually too. And I, you know, that's that's maybe that's part of the new future that we don't all have to go there. We can take part without being there, which yeah. will be pretty good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Mark, uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Good. Thanks. <laughs>